Hi everybody, it's Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers, one of the surgeons here at Visionary Eye Doctors. Thank you for joining us today again on the EYE Show. This is episode 37. We're going to talk today about something called the gut microbiome. We've talked briefly about it in some of the diet episodes, but I want to delve into it a little bit deeper. I was on vacation a couple of weeks ago visiting my dad in Miami, and I was visiting with a lot of friends, and it's amazing how the topic of diet always comes up. There's always a question of what am I eating? What should I be eating? I'm not a world's expert, as people know, in diet, but it's a very uh, big passion of mine because of the... Uh, history that I've told you about of my friend that was told she had three months to live with breast cancer and ended up living about seven and a half years later and that's how this journey began. So most surgeons including myself know very little about the gut microbiome. It's not something we were taught in medical school or residency. Uh, it's not something we really read in the literature of ophthalmology or any surgical uh, journal but it's very important and there's more and more data coming out every single week on how your gut, the bacteria in your gut, which is the gut microbiome, all the many millions of colonies of bacteria can affect everything from your longevity, your risk of diabetes, your risk of inflammation in the eye in terms of uveitis, probably even dry eye, although that study has not been done to my knowledge, risk of, of course, cancer and depression, mental health, sleep habits, it's related to everything. And so one of the things I mentioned before is that during COVID, there was a very interesting study that showed that one of the biggest travesties of the isolation protocols is that the gut microbiome in the large percentage of people decreased in diversity. And the diversity of the microbiome is crucial for all these things we just talked about, improving your longevity, cancer risk, risk of inflammation, autoimmune disease, depression, all that kind of stuff. So I wanna talk a little bit more about what we mean by gut microbiome, what bacteria we're talking about exactly, what are we trying to do? What are the things we can do to improve our microbiome? What are the foods we should eat? And what should we maybe talk about with our children to kind of teach them about this? Because it's a crucial, considered now, organ. So it's very interesting that people are talking about the gut microbiome as something as important as your liver or your heart or your eyeball, which is very interesting because that's not something that most doctors know about. So there was a recent article in the Broad Institute uh, that kind of brought this to interest. Recently, it was from yesterday or two days ago. Um, so how urinary tract infections are associated with the gut microbiome diversity and how antibiotics, when we give an antibiotic to a patient, it destroys their gut microbiome pretty much completely. And so now more and more doctors are recommending taking probiotics, uh, prebiotics, probiotics, at the same time as you take the antibiotic and especially after. And I highly recommend that. I'm one of those surgeons and doctors that very rarely gives antibiotics unless it's absolutely necessary and ideally if there's a diagnosis. My father, who's a surgeon, taught me this uh, because he feels that my, my mother had a negative reaction to antibiotics when I was a baby and it led to a terrible uh, long hospital stay because of the reaction to the antibiotic, not because of the original disease. So he's always been very natural with treating uh, the, our, his kids, me, and, his, and my siblings, and his patients. So I'm kind of in that uh, realm. So the idea is that the more antibiotics you give to a patient with urinary tract infection, you don't make it better. You want to try to restore their gut microbiome. So that's one of the papers that kind of talks about the different types of good bacteria in your, in your microbiome, bad bacteria. One of the most important ones is lactobacillus, as we all know. One of the potential bad ones is E. coli. And so there's an H. pylori is kind of a bad bug. So those are the ones that can be theoretically more associated with ulcers and even cancer for some for some patients. Whereas lactobacillus, and there's a few more I'll, I'll mention, are very good at protecting your gut from inflammation. And that's the name of the game. These bacteria are trying to decrease the whole general inflammation of the gut, which tends to affect the whole body's inflammatory response to certain uh, inflammatory problems. So one of the things that um, I ran across, which I found very interesting, was a study in the Netherlands, of course leave it to the Dutch to do this kind of study, uh, that they found that a French kiss for 10 seconds gave you 80 million new bacteria, which I thought was very interesting. So it's kind of along the lines of isolation is not good for people. Hugging, handshaking even is really crucial. And of course we've been very careful about putting alcohol in our hands and so forth, and we have to be precautious during COVID and post-COVID eras, era, but at the same time, I think it's okay to be a little bit more 
not so scared and try to exchange your flora sometimes with other people because it does help. There's another study that showed that if you have live with somebody that is lean and less uh, kind of less fat, you're more likely to have their gut flora, especially if it's, you know, your loved one, than if you live with somebody that is overweight, which I found very interesting. And then, of course, the whole category of fecal transplantation, which sounds disgusting, but it's being used in thousands of patients to treat ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's disease, all kinds of diseases of the colon, and even considering it using for people with recurrent UTI, urinary tract infections, or recurrent infections or an inflammation, because if we can put the fecal material into another person, a good, a good patient, let's say a lean patient, that person's gut flora can change to the point that their metabolism will increase, their inflammatories will decrease. This has been repeated, a study repeated in rats where they take a fat mouse, put the feces into a thin mouse, the thin mouse becomes fat and vice versa. It's been very interesting to, to kind of follow this, this um, quite unusual protocol, but now it's becoming a staple of treatment for many uh, patients. So uh, just to consider that that is something that some patients should look into. How can you improve your gut flora naturally? And so there's a lot of things that you can do to do that. So let's make, just confirm um, that we covered this. So here's some of the names before I go through what you can do of the uh, big good bacteria you're looking for and when you're looking for just how to what foods to eat we're trying to increase as i mentioned the lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria those are the key ones that really do increase the um, the ability of the body to kind of attack inflammatory factors in the body so what foods can you eat so there's a whole bunch of different uh, websites out there saying this is good and this is good and I actually did publish a few papers to kind of look at which is the best food to eat. So the best food to eat, which I'm going to go through a little bit more, is kefir, K-E-F-I-R, and it can be milk-based, either cow's milk or goat milk or water-based kefir. I would recommend probably water-based kefir because the probiotic concentration is pretty much equivalent and you won't get such a high sugar spike. There's a little bit more carbohydrates in the milk or goat milk-based kefir than the water-based kefir. I've not tried these kefirs. Uh, yeah, I've tried a little bit, but not like extensively. So that's something I'm going to do after this podcast is go get some kefir. Uh, the second is kombucha. Kombucha is excellent. We have a lot of kombucha in my house. My, my son is a big kombucha advocate. He puts different types. He makes his own. He has strawberry and ginger kombucha, and we experiment in the family to see which one we like. So we're a big kombucha family. Kombucha has tea. It's fermented from usually some type of either uh, kind of a caffeinated tea. Some people probably could use uh, green tea, um, but we've used caffeinated tea, so it tends to have caffeine, whereas kefir does not have caffeine. Uh, kombucha is not a milk-based uh, product at all. It's basically just tea with some sugar and a scoby, which is considered the mother uh, colony, and it produces more, more uh, kind of colonies that produce this fermented uh, product. So the name of the game in probiotics is fermented, whether it's fermented milk, fermented water, or some type of component of that that you use bacteria to ferment the kind of sugar in the water, or fermented cabbage like uh, kimchi. So kimchi is a very excellent source of probiotic uh, bacteria that will help you restore your microbiome. Uh, the other ones that were more surprising to me were things like kiwi, which of course kiwi is very high in vitamin C, vitamin K, vitamin E. Vitamin K is very helpful for your muscle of your gut to kind of have that peristaltic movement, which is essential in digestion. Uh, we, sauerkraut, of course, is excellent. My husband is a huge sauerkraut fan. He's Dutch. The Germans, of course, and the Dutch love sauerkraut. And so that's basically fermented cabbage, which then leads to an increase of these bacteria within that fermented cabbage, but also vitamin C and the pectin in some of the, the products also help with um, inulin as well, help improve the actual ability of the bacteria to do what it needs to do in your gut. Yogurt we know about for sure. Yogurt can be tricky. You always want to try to find some type of yogurt that has a very low sugar content, ideally zero, and a very low carb content. So Greek yogurt is better than regular yogurt, especially if it says like Yo Play yogurt. You have to be careful. You have to read the label. Icelandic yogurt is not as good as Greek yogurt in terms of the probiotic content. So Greek yogurt is a little bit better. Things like bananas are lovely for the probiotic component, but it can spike your sugar. So again, be very careful if you're a diabetic that you read the label on what you're eating to make sure you're not spiking your sugar in an attempt to improve your microbiome because you could, you know, kind of um, basically 
undo the good effects of what you're eating. Apples are, are good for uh, the microbiome as well and they have their own microcultures that basically are transferred into your gut, which is kind of interesting, but again, they can kind of spike your sugar, so be careful with that. Miso and dojang, which is very uh, common in Korea, is a very good source of probiotics. Those are fer fermented, uh, fermented soybean paste, uh, which, is, which I've had before, we've all had, so that's good to do. And black-eyed peas, I did not know, was also a good source of its high fiber, high protein, and also has a, um, the, it acts as a probiotic in your gut. And then cranberries. Cranberries, of course, are more acidic, and they do add some, uh, the addition of some probiotic effect to your gut. But again, the beans and the cranberries can spike your sugar, so just be aware of that. So when we talk about kombucha, and we talk about water-based kefir and milk-based kefir. So how do you incorporate that really into your life? So kombucha you can just drink. We do that frequently in our home. Kefir is more sometimes mixed with something. You can of course kind of add an ingredient to it, either put it in oatmeal, which uh, is a lovely uh, gluten-free product. But again, oatmeal can sometimes spike your sugar, so you have to be careful with oatmeal. But kefir is not a bad idea. So what, can, what three things can you do? So of course you want to increase your probiotics in general, especially if you're about to start antibiotics or you need antibiotics antibiotics. Sleep is a crucial component to improving your gut flora. Your microbiome depends a lot on your cortisol level, your stress levels. So the more sleep you get, the better you're doing. So those are the two key things you can do. Increase your probiotics and then get more sleep. And the third, third thing is really decrease your level of stress. So that involves exercise, uh, trying to do things that really help you maintain your peace, trying to keep your emotional level kind of at a stable component. So anger and frustration and resentment don't take over because believe it or not, it looks like those things can affect even your flora, which I found very interesting. I hope you found this very interesting and we'll pass it on to friends and family. If you have any questions, please reach out to my team here at Visionary Eye Doctors. Thank you for joining.